Has anybody heard of a gentleman by the name of Derek Redman? Show of hands, anybody? Does that name ring a bell? Nobody? Derek Redman uh, was an Olympian. In fact, he was a runner. And uh, in the 1992 Summer Olympics, he, w he was, uh, by all rights, slated to be the favorite in the 400 meter event. And he had trained hard. He had prepared himself the best that he could. He got up on the starting block, started the race with all the other contestants, and it looked like he was going to win. He started to pull off, pull out fr uh, in front of the pack, and then something happened that he probably hadn't planned on. Something catastrophic happened that he probably hadn't planned on. And that's really not the interesting thing I find about Derek Redmond's story. What I find interesting about Derek Redmond's story is what he did to respond to this kind of catastrophic thing that, that really kind of threw all of his planning down the drain. And I would like you to just take a look at this just for a second. Derek Redmond, the best form he's shown since he broke the British record. He was in great shape, you know, he, he was, had a chance, possibility of maybe getting a medal there. The Cuban Hernandez has got uh, Redmond to aim at, and so too in lane number three is Steve Lewis, but Redmond's got off very fast indeed, and so too is Ismail of Qatar. Down the back straight, he's the fractional leader. Bada of Nigeria has gone very quickly, and Redmond has broken down. He's on the track, kneeling down, and Derek Redmond, on his injury problem, the jinx has struck again. Running down the back straight, I heard a funny clap or a pop, and I honestly, for a split second, thought I'd been shot. Uh, and then, obviously, I realised I've, I've pulled a hamstring. And then when the pain sort of died down, I remembered where I was and what I was doing, and I remember thinking, quick, you're in the Olympic semi-finals, you prat, get up and start running. And I got to the 200 metre mark after hobbling 50 metres, and looked across and all the guys had finished, and it pretty much hit me that, you know, it ain't gonna happen, it's all over. I would have laid there, you know, to be honest, there's no way I would have got up, because a hamstring, when you got a hamstring, you know you got a hamstring. He just wants to finish. His dad's trying to run under the track to stop him. He's going to tell him, Derek, don't. The old man went to put his arms around me, and I was just about to try and push him off because I thought it was someone else. I didn't see him. He sort of jogged from behind. And uh, he said, look, you don't need to do this. You can stop him now. You haven't got nothing to prove. And I said, oh, I have. You know, get me back into lane five. I want to finish. Now in the greatest arena in sport, he's getting the cheer of the games. I would never have wanted to be in Derek's shoe at that time. You know, it was a sad moment. It was a, you know, a great moment, you know, in the sport, to be honest. It's a, a figure, a picture that just stays in your mind forever because you don't want to see any athlete having to go through that. You just knew how destroyed he was and just how much that race meant to him. If I had to create a video definition of the word perseverance, I probably would just copy that one. Because uh, through all the stuff, the pain, uh, the, the, the realization that he didn't have to do anything, Derek Redman continued to push through because he just wanted to finish the race. Perseverance is something that is talked about quite a bit in the New Testament. In fact, uh, the, the New Testament writer Paul talks about perseverance a lot. And he writes a letter to Timothy at the very end of his ministry, and he says, I have finished the race, and so you also continue to persevere in the race. And it's important because last week we talked about God who calls us to these impossible things. And God only can make the impossible possible, but we can't just sit there. There is a, there is a, a cooperation that, that has to come from us when God calls us to these impossible things. We have to be willing to push through, to get on with it, to go to the end, regardless of what comes in front of us, regardless of the 
hills or the valleys that we might, we might come over. Now, when I say perseverance, what do you think of? What comes to mind when I say perseverance? Obviously, we think of Derek Redmond and just not quitting, not giving up, making it to the end no matter what. Maybe even facing adversity. Things come up against us and we push through. Finishing the race like Paul. Pushing through always in, in, in proclamation of the gospel throughout his whole ministry no matter what came against him. That was Paul. Maybe it's proving people wrong. We all have these you know, people who cast shade, right? They throw shade at us our whole lives saying things like, you can't do that. You're not equipped for that. There's no way. So maybe perseverance to us means just proving people wrong, or maybe it even means proving yourself wrong. Because we can also throw our own shade at ourselves. We can talk ourselves out of so many things, especially where God is concerned. When God calls us into things, we might say things, and I said this last week, that fear could just cripple us. So maybe perseverance means we have to prove ourselves wrong. But today, in the 21st century, there are some different challenges when we talk about perseverance because we live in this culture that thrives on instant gratification. If I send you a text message, I want one back within a couple of seconds. If I send you an email, I wait at my inbox for a response. My boss, this is a true story, my boss has 70,000 unread emails in his inbox. That My OCD would just be off the chain at that point in time. We do that. We post something on social media. How many times do we check that in the course of the next 10 minutes to see how many people have liked our picture or commented on our photo or responded to our post? We live in this instant gratification world, and that can affect the way that we view perseverance because perseverance is one thing when we know what the end is, when we know what to expect when we see that there is something out there that we can grab onto. Derek Redmond had a, a, an immense, uh, great perseverance, but he knew what the end was. He only had to make it 400 meters with a torn hamstring. But what about when we can't? What about when we can't see the end? What about when we don't know what the end is? What about when there's no way for us to know? Because this is what happens when God calls us to these impossible things that we talked about last week. Rarely does God show us the end and then call us to the beginning. He rarely ever does that. Most of the time, he just throws us in head first and leads us through. And perseverance becomes something way different then. When we don't know the end, pushing through and finishing the race is much different. And today we're gonna look at somebody who was in that very situation Somebody who got thrown into a situation by God, God and, didn't know what the end looked like, didn't even see the end. And yet, we'll find that he's a great example of perseverance. And we wouldn't even know about, you know, we, we wouldn't know uh, anything about this particular character unless we really dig in because he's hardly even mentioned at all in the New Testament. To my count, there are four mentions of this particular character, and that's it, in the whole of the New Testament. He doesn't appear to play a major part in the nativity story at all, which makes, which makes his example even more important. Today we're looking at the intersection of God and Joseph. Now, I'm not talking about Old Testament Joseph. We've talked about him quite a bit. I'm talking about Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus Christ. And we find Joseph's story to be very interesting, at least I find Joseph's story to be very interesting, because he, he not only exhibits a great perseverance, but there is another quality that we find in Joseph without which perseverance becomes almost impossible. Now let me set it up for you. We left last week with Mary, with child. Mary had gotten through her fear gotten through her station in life to accept what Jesus had done. Now, at some point before our text begins here, Joseph has found out that Mary is with child, and he's, he's in the midst of making this decision. What am I going to do about that? We talked about some of those options last week, and I'm going to mention them again briefly in just a second. We're in Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 1, if you're following along. It'll be up here if you're not, if you don't have a Bible or, or a Bible app. 
And so this is where we pick up, and this is what Matthew writes. And because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. Now, some translations say because Joseph was a righteous man. So it's not just a law-abiding citizen. He was a good man, a very good man. Because he was a good man and didn't want to expose Mary to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Remember, we said last week that they were betrothed, so by all legal uh, ramifications, they were in fact married. The only difference was they were not living in the same house. So when it says he took Mary home, that made it all completely legal. Now Joseph had three choices where Mary was concerned. The first was his initial choice, which was divorce. Divorce wasn't necessarily clean. It wasn't necessarily without consequence, especially for Mary. And he loved Mary. We could see that because he didn't want her to be shamed. He didn't want her to feel all the wrath of the people. The second choice was stoning. And if he loved Mary, he certainly wouldn't have wanted her to be stoned to death. And the third choice was to stay and, and, and do what the angel of the Lord told him to do. None of those was without some measure of shame, because even if he stayed, this was a small town. People talked. People knew that Joseph was probably not the actual father of this child. So even if he stayed, there was some amount of shame going on that they had done something they probably weren't supposed to do before marriage, before they were in the same home together. There wasn't really a good option. But what we do find out is that God spoke to Joseph, and Joseph obeyed. Joseph did what God asked, and that wasn't the only time that Joseph did that. There are, there are more instances in here, and uh, the next time we hear about Joseph is after Jesus is born and after the wise men have visited. Now, in our kind of instant gratification world, we believe that Jesus was born, the next day the wise men show up, three days later we take the nativity down and everything's good, but that really wasn't the case. There was about a year's time between the birth of Jesus and the time when the wise men showed up, the magi showed up, and, and around about in their journey, following this star that they believed was signaling the birth of the Messiah, they happened to stop by Herod's castle. They were at Herod's place. Told him what they were looking for, and Herod says, hmm, you let me know when you find him, because I want to honor him too. But he didn't want to honor him. And so the wise men visit Joseph, and then they leave, but they tricked Herod because they never went back and reported to Herod where they had found Jesus. So Herod got really angry, and Herod decided to send a, a team of henchmen out to try to find this baby Jesus and do away with him. And that's where we pick up our next passage. It says, when they had gone, the magi, the wise men, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. Again, he didn't question the angel. He just got up and did what God commanded him to. And they were in Egypt for a while, and sooner or later, Herod dies, like we all do. And so uh, Jesus, by all rights, was out of danger. The danger was gone. So again, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother to go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are, de are dead. And so he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judah in place of his father, now this was Herod's son, so probably not a nice guy either, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So by my count, if you were counting along, four times, four times God spoke to Joseph. Four times Joseph responded and did what God was asking him to do. Now I wonder, I just wonder, if God 
would have continued to talk to Joseph, would have continued to push him into God's plan if Joseph had the first time just said, mm, nope, I think I'll take the divorce. I'll be okay with that. I wonder what God would have done because, you know, sometimes we do that, don't we? God talks to us and we say, hmm, I don't think I'm going to be up for that right now. And then, and then we complain that God doesn't, we don't hear from God, right? So we, we don't respond to him. Maybe he stops talking to us. Maybe, maybe he would have done that to Joseph, but we don't know because Joseph didn't stop responding. Joseph continued to respond to God no matter what. And that takes something very special because God had big plans for Joseph. Imagine being the earthly father of the Savior of the world. Imagine that. I mean, you know how hard it is to take care of your own kids. I had three. I can't imagine being the earthly father of the Savior of the world. Maybe God, in this whole setup of protecting Mary and, and Jesus from all the things that might have been happening in Jesus' really early years, maybe he was testing Joseph to see if he would be really the best candidate to be the role model on earth for his only son, Jesus. And if he did, he certainly passed. He did. Does God ever test you that way? Does God ever give you something small to see how you respond? And then reward you with bigger and bigger responsibilities in God's economy? I can't be sure about that for Joseph, but what we do know is that Joseph was a man of immense and unfailing faith. And I'm not talking about, um, I believe in God faith. Because it's easy to believe in God. I'm talking about, I believe in God's plan. I believe in God's plan because that's a, a, an entirely different thing than I believe in God. We can believe in God and not believe in his plan. We can believe in Jesus and not trust that he has our best interest in heart. We can believe in all of the stuff that religion puts out there and still not believe that God is moving us into a direction that he wants us to go. There is a big difference between I believe in God and I believe in God's plan. And listen to what Joseph did. Okay, he didn't ask for proof. When the angel come and came and said, uh, Mary is pregnant from the Holy Spirit, he didn't say, do you have a DNA test? I'd like to see that. When he came and said, Herod's on his way, go move to Egypt, he didn't say, wait a minute, uh, that must be fake news, because I did not see that on my news feed and Facebook. I didn't see anything about Herod sending out his henchmen coming after my son Jesus, so I'm not sure I'm going to do that. When the angel said, go back, he didn't say, hold on, I didn't see anything in the real world. I don't see anything like that. He didn't ask for proof. In fact, Jesus wasn't even his real son. And after all, these were just dreams, just visions in someone's head while they sleep. I don't know that I would <laughs> I have some really weird dreams, so I'm not so sure that I would be listening to those things and doing it. You know, if I, if, I, if I, you know, had a dream like that, I'm not so sure I would respond and say, I know that was from God, but Joseph did. Joseph believed in God's plan. Joseph believed that God would lead him to a place where God wanted him. It's hard for us because we always want proof. When God asks us to move, how often do we say, okay, God, but if this is really what you want, would you give me a sign? If you really want me to go into the ministry, would you just surround me with a bunch of people who will help make my job easy? If, if you really want me to take this woman as my wife, would you... Um, just send some, make the tree fall. We ask God for proof all the time. And sometimes God does give signs. Sometimes God talks that way. But mostly, he just wants us to follow him without questions, without conditions, without asking for proof of why God is doing what God is doing. You've heard of unconditional love. We talk about unconditional love, the, the unconditional love of Jesus all the time. That nothing we can do can unearn the love of God and the love of Jesus. But Joseph had unconditional faith. He had a faith that didn't question. He had a faith that didn't put restrictions. He had a faith 
that didn't put conditions on what God was asking them to do. And unconditional faith enables God to use us to the fullest. And there's probably a good reason why God chose a man with such unconditional faith. He honored that faith by entrusting his only son to him. God, who was sent to earth to be human, was now in the care of his earthly father, Joseph. And fathers in the day were very important role models. And, and they should be today as well. I'm not, you know, there's no question there. Fathers should always be important role models. But, but in the year zero AD, it was a patriarchal society. So fathers taught sons, and sons taught their sons, and sons taught their sons. And this is how the family really got its name, its presence, its worth. Fathers taught them about their faith, about relationships, how to interact with people, taught them about honor, about respect, would teach them their trade, how to get along in life, how to earn a living, how to support a family, would teach them all that stuff. It was a very important thing. And I wonder what a day in Joseph's life might have looked like. Now, Joseph was a carpenter, and um, Jesus was a carpenter as well. Now, we think of a carpenter by 21st century standards. We think of somebody who maybe is cutting crown molding and installing in your living room. You know, got a little band saw, a little uh, miter saw. And, or, or maybe a carpenter is somebody who's building a table for you, a custom table or something like that. But in the day, Joseph's day, a carpenter could have done anything from cutting down a tree to uh, clearing brush, anything that had to do with wood. That's what a carpenter did. All of that stuff. And of course, he also did the stuff we think of, like making furniture and fixing furniture. And he probably had this little shop set up out in front of his house where he would do things. And all the while, Jesus is tagging along. All the while, Joseph living his life as a righteous man, Jesus is tagging along. I remember when I was young, my father on the weekends, he worked during the week, so on the weekends he would get to his honeydew list. And he would go around the house doing things like fixing doorknobs and hinges and light bulbs and, you know, maybe change the oil in the car, whatever it was. And I was always right there. Now, I didn't have any tools. I didn't have anything like that. But everything my father did, I would act like I was doing. So I had my own set of invisible screwdrivers, my own set of invisible pliers, all that stuff. And that's how I learned to do many of the things that I can do now, just by following my father around. So we know that it wasn't any different. In, in Jesus' day, in Joseph's day. That's how Jesus learned about being human, was from his father, Joseph. Even though Jesus was God, Joseph still had a big responsibility to raise this boy in a godly manner. Can you imagine the pressure? Can you imagine the pressure to raise the Son of God and to rise to that challenge, to rise to the challenge of being a godly father to Jesus Christ took something special. And this is where we get back to where we started. This is one thing that we notice about Joseph is that he was a man of great perseverance. And that might not seem like a big deal if we knew what the end was. It might not seem like a big deal if Jesus, uh, Joseph knew that Jesus was going to do X and Y and Z, and at the end, everything would be done. If Joseph knew any of that, pushing through his daily, day-to-day -day life of raising Jesus as his son might not have been a big deal, but he didn't. By all accounts, the last time we hear mention of Joseph is when Jesus was 12. Some of you may know this story that Mary and Joseph and Jesus were in town, and they lost him. You ever lost your child in the store? I used to hide from my mother in the store on purpose. Um, but they lost him and found him teaching in the temple, and this was when Jesus was 12. That's the last time we hear of Joseph at all. And the historians surmise that, that Joseph died somewhere between the time Jesus was 12 and the time he started his earthly ministry at the age of 30. And, and this is important because Joseph never saw signs of wonder. Joseph never saw Jesus' miracles. Joseph never saw Jesus' ministry. 
Joseph never saw any of the Messiah-ness that everyone was talking about. He never saw, met Jesus' disciples. He never saw Jesus walking on the water. What he saw was my little boy. He couldn't possibly know what the end of that story was. He didn't know the end. And he never saw the end. And that kind of perseverance is only enabled by the unconditional faith that Joseph had. That is the only way when God calls us to big impossible things for which we don't know the end. Unconditional faith is the only way we can continue to push through, to make it to the end, to finish the race. Works the same for us as it did for Joseph because God calls each of us to those big things. God calls each of us to a plan Uh, to a purpose in his plan of redemption for this world. And we don't know what the end is. And we don't know what his plans are. So what do we do? How do we wrap our head around that? Many of you know uh, our story. Uh, A couple of years ago, we just went through this place of despair and darkness. The bottom completely fell out of our lives. Completely fell out of our lives. And what happened to us was we started to have a faith that had conditions on it. We had many conversations like, well, I I understand God has a plan, but if he would just show me today that that he's working in our lives, if he could just show me that, I can push through another day. God, I know you have a plan, but, but could you just speak something to us? And that continued for months and years. And finally, we got to the point where we just had to make the choice to say, okay, God, whatever happens, we're going to thank you for being God. And we're going to thank you for being a good God because God is good at being good. He is. And it wasn't until we stopped putting those conditions on this situation that that was happening in our life. It wasn't until we stopped asking God for signs and and all the stuff that we humans want to hear from God. It wasn't until that that we were able to just push through and persevere. And, And things weren't perfect. Let me tell you, things were not perfect, but they were better. They they were manageable. We were able to live day to day and know that God had it. We weren't sure where he was going to take us in that journey, but we knew he was taking us somewhere. And this is where we all live, isn't it? Is there anyone in here who hasn't been pushed by God, been tapped on the back of the head, been pushed on the shoulder to to do something in God's plan of redemption for this world, and we don't just step back and say, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Can you give me a little something? Could you pay me today for a hamburger tomorrow? the way we humans work. And that's the same as Joseph. He could have done that. He could have said, God, could you give me a sign? But he didn't. And we all play this wonderful, amazing, and yet so uncertain part in God's plan. We do. We don't know. And here's the problem. Even if our faith is strong, even if our faith is really, really strong, it's still a faith that we see at our level, right here, through our eyes. Our faith is still viewed by our human sight. It's viewed at our level, but God, God doesn't see things from our level. God doesn't see your challenges from your level. He sees them from his level. God doesn't see your problems and your struggles from your level. He sees them from his level. He doesn't see the impossible from your level. When you see the mountain in front of you, God has already looked past the mountain and knows what's on the other side because he sees it from his level. He doesn't see your challenges or your hurts or your lives from your level, not from my level. He doesn't see them from our level. He sees them from his level. He sees his plans from his level through his eyes. But we can't do that. So if we're going to rise up, if we're going to persevere through the impossible and wonderful and awesome things that God has in store for us, the only way to do that is through unconditional faith. 
Faith that doesn't question. And faith that doesn't put conditions around what God's going to do. And that's what we learn from God and Joseph, this story of God and Joseph, that Joseph never once questioned God. He didn't know what the plan was. He never saw the end. And yet, he persevered with unconditional faith. So are you up to that challenge? It's not easy. What about the God and you story? How does that play out? Joseph was the protector on earth of Jesus Christ. Are you willing to persevere with unconditional faith to protect Jesus in your heart so that when you get called to big and mighty and impossible things, you can finish the race and go to the end? And maybe there's some of us here who want to believe but are still asking questions. Still saying, could you send me a sign, God? I, 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 I read all the stuff about you. I see what Scripture says about Jesus. Could you just send me a sign and then I'll believe? What about you? Because this wonderful amazing plan that we're all called to starts with a step of unconditional faith. Unconditional faith to believe that Jesus Christ did in fact come to this earth for you. God with us. And here's another amazing thing about uh, Redmond's story. That <clears throat> he had a father who was willing to get up. And even though he said to him, you don't have to do this, son. He said, but if you're going to do it, I'm going to walk with you. And when we give ourselves unconditionally in faith to Jesus Christ, we get that father who walks with us, even when we can't. Sometimes carries us when we can't walk. And through unconditional faith, we're able to persevere through whatever God gives us. What about God and you? Let's pray. Father, we are so in love with you. To be able to take your word handed down so many centuries ago, and apply it to our lives is awesome and amazing and wonderful. That you speak through these stories into our hearts, into our minds, into our soul is just an awesome and wonderful thing. God, thank you for being in this place with us tonight. Thank you for the people who have who have you have brought here because we know that if you have if you have led them to this place, then you have a wonderful plan for their life. And if there is anyone, God, who just needs to take that step of unconditional faith today, just ask that you lay it on their heart to finally stop asking questions, to finally put away the conditions, to finally just say, okay, I'm done. and rely on you. God, we ask that <clears throat> you keep everyone safe who is here with us tonight until we, until we meet again, and that, that you can continue to uh, just penetrate the hearts uh, and, and, and minds of the people here with your word. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's name, the name uh, no other name can give us life than Jesus. And together we all say, Amen.